thank you for coming and sharing God's word with us, John. It's a real pleasure having you and Rosemary with us, and the fellowship, and being able to have a man that we trust in the word of God is very important to us. So thank you. Let's pray. Mm. Father, we do rejoice in your loving kindness. Mm. Your mercy just blows our minds. We stand in awe of the grace of God that should love sinners like us. We mm -hmm. thank you for your loving kindness today. Thank you for one another. Thank you for bringing John and Rosemary into our lives all those years ago and for the many times I've uh, been with us and shared from your word and shared with us in other ways. And now, Lord, as John opens your word, I pray that your spirit would give him clarity of thought and speech. Anoint your word, we pray, Holy Spirit that each of us would be strengthened, encouraged, built up. And Lord, if there's areas we need challenge on, we ask that you would challenge our consciences and convict us and affirm us of the things, the truths that we have right in our lives. Lead us by your spirit and your word through John's teaching now, we ask in your wonderful name of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Yeah, bless you, Lincoln. <laughs> Kia ora koutou katoa. Good to be back with you again and so I'm just picking up on the series in Acts which is the way I like to do my uh, visiting speaking. It saves me spending half of my time trying to work out what to talk about. I can just get stuck in and start studying it. So I see uh, Lincoln's Skipped a little bit, but we're into Acts 8, 26 to 40 was my uh, assigned passage for this morning. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So it's not a long passage, so I might just read it first. And, uh, and then what I'd like to do is just go through the narrative together to get ourselves solidly in the historical context and then come back through that narrative and look for what we can learn from Philip's evangelism. So Acts 8 verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit, of, the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through the, as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So we've got through our few passages, a few chapters in Acts. We've had uh, the Holy Spirit coming down in Acts 2 and we've had the apostles staying in Jerusalem, work, working mostly with Jews and then we've come through um, a little bit of early church history, very early church history. We've seen Stephen 
uh, and Philip and others chosen to serve. And then in the previous passage, there was uh, Stephen's martyrdom. And now we're just picking up in chapter 8. After Philip has proclaimed Christ in Samaria. So the gospel, uh, what I sometimes call the unstoppable gospel, is just creeping out uh, everywhere. It's gone from, from Jews and it's moving to Samaritans. It's going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And it's going f- uh, from just really being focused around the apostles to extending out now to these people like Stephen and Philip. So who's Philip? So, a bit of revision. Uh, He's not the Apostle Philip. And we know that from 8 chapter 1. There arose a day on that... Sorry, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles somehow managed to stay in Jerusalem. And then reading verses 4 to 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip, when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So Philip was one of the seven called to serve tables back in Jerusalem. So he was of good repute and full of the Spirit. We see that in Acts uh, 6 verse 3. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom. He was one of the first Christians to proclaim Christ outside of Jerusalem. As we've just read, he's he's taking it into Samaria. Say first Christians because remember Jesus, he went through Samaria too. He preached the gospel to the woman at the well. And her and... Everyone who heard her, that whole town, also turned to Christ. And yet Christ hadn't been uh, crucified, buried and resurrected at that point. So I guess they still had an incomplete knowledge of Christ at that point, but they certainly believed he was the, the Christ, the Messiah. So Philip here, he's a, a forerunner. And yeah, like Stephen, who was also operating in signs and wonders. Philip here is now seeing these signs and wonders authenticating his ministry as he takes it uh, beyond the apostles and beyond the Jews. And I think Luke, the the writer here of Acts, is carrying us through Acts 1.8. Yeah, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and you'll be proclaiming, better read it properly, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Luke is, is taking us through that program in his, in his book of Acts here and we're walking through that and we're seeing it going into Samaria now. So that's a little bit about Philip. That's about all we know about him so far. Verse 27. Reading from the NIV. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This Gentile had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So my comments now. This Gentile had gone to Jerusalem to worship and as a Gentile he would be excluded from the temple only allowed as far as the court of the Gentiles that's the court where Jesus went through turning over tables because the traders had gone in there Uh, when I read those stories about Jesus I think three times he had to clean out the temple uh, 
I rejoice because as far as I know, I haven't got any Jewish blood in me and it speaks to me of Christ's love for us Gentiles because that was as far as we could go into the temple. It would be the death sentence to try and go further and later on Paul's accused of that, uh, of taking some a Gentile in, uh, which he'd never done because it would have meant, yeah, death. So this Ethiopian, he's not allowed into the court of the Gentiles, but also bear in mind Deuteronomy 23 verse 1. No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. So tuck that away in the back of your mind, we'll come back to that a bit later. So yeah, a eunuch, uh, the medical description there, emasculated by crushing or cutting, is not allowed in the assembly of the Lord. And in the NIV it talks about Kandaki. So if Kandaki refers to Gasamot Kandaki the sixth, she's the 16th female monarch of the regnal list spanning from 4530 BC to 1779 AD. So um, we picked that up from Ethiopian history, so it's tying in with biblical history. If that's the case, if she's the uh, if she's the Queen of Ethiopia at that point, then Acts date would be dated no earlier than 34 AD using Ethiopian records. Luke wrote, wrote Acts at around AD 60 to 63, so about 30 years after the resurrection. So somehow we're in that, we've got no time frame here, but we're in, in the first five or so years of the church. So by the time Luke wrote, 30 years later, he's had time to get an overview of what happened as the gospel went from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, or in their case, the ends of the Roman Empire as they knew it in those times, as it moved from Jews to Gentiles and from large groups to individuals. Skipping down to verse 929, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. Oh, sorry. We'll go one more. So this Ethiopian, just using Google Maps, which interestingly I put in uh, to go via Gaza because he's on the road to Gaza and you couldn't walk through Gaza. Google Maps wouldn't you let you do that. You could have in those days. So. <laughs> but um, I've got a pointer here. Yeah, no. So Ethiopia is not what we think of Ethiopia today which is on the Horn of Africa, right down on the bottom there. Ethiopia then is referring to this area between Khartoum and Sudan to Aswan in the south of Egypt. So the borders were different. So this Ethiopian's come from somewhere in there and probably come up around somewhere close to Cairo. Well, Google Maps wouldn't take me through Gaza, but uh, it's gone around the long way up through Jordan and to Israel. So, yeah, he's come about uh, 2,860 odd kilometres if he was walking. And, uh, yeah, and I'm not sure how long it would take in a chariot, but it was a long trip. Verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So, back in verse 26, an angel of the Lord had said to Philip, in verse 29 now, the Spirit said, and we'll see in verse 39 when we get down there, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And again, this sort of reinforces what a lot of us call the book of Acts, not so much the, the Acts of the Apostle, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's in the driver's seat here. He's very closely telling Philip, what to do, where to go, and Philip as a believer has the fullness of the Holy Spirit in him, and also so what to say. Verses 32 to 33, now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. 
Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? So what beautiful timing that this Ethiopian was reading, Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 8, just at the time when Philip could hear him and when Philip's told to go over to him. So the Jews who stoned Stephen in Jerusalem had had the writings of Isaiah for 700 years. They had all of the information there, but they were not teachable. So it is today, we've, uh, we've got so much information today, but so many people are just dull to the scriptures. I mean, that prophecy now is 2,700 years old. And if, uh, for those of you that know Isaiah 53, it's just so pinpoint specific to the death, burial and resurrection of Christ that, uh, yeah, very hard for the Jews to miss it. And yet they were, and they stoned Stephen because of that. So verse 34, the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. So beginning with this scripture, just wanted to make it clear, we're missing a whole lot of information here about actually what Philip talked about. But he began in Isaiah 53, and he went on from there. And it reminds me a little bit of Luke 24, 27, where Jesus is uh, walking along with his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognise him. But beginning with Moses and all the prophets, so in other words, going right back to Genesis, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now Philip, being brought up in the Jewish scriptures and what we now call the Old Testament, but then it would have been the Hebrew scriptures, yeah, would have known all of those um, 39 books or scrolls. He would have memorised many of them, the first five of them to, as a boy, so now he sits down with this Ethiopian who's trying to work out what he's reading and starts explaining to him everything that the scriptures said about this Jesus. Verse 36, And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptised? Again, timing. Timing. As the scholars try and work out where it might have been that Philip baptised this eunuch, they pretty much narrow it down to only two places where there's water. They're on a desert road going from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so it doesn't really matter where it was, but my point is, yeah, there's some divine timing going on here, A, with where Philip is, and B, as the conversation goes along, that they just so happen to come across some water. Now, between verse 36, if you have a look at your Bible, your Bible might go from verse 36 to 38. Um, so some later manuscripts include more material after verse 36. So when included in a translation, it is numbered as Acts 8.37, which says, He said to him, If you believe with your whole heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So from what we know from our textual history, somebody's thought, yeah, we need a kind of a footnote in there. We need a bit of a commentary in there just in case people think, well, Philip's... Uh, explained a few scriptures to the Ethiopian, now he's going to baptise him. So, and, but that's probably coming later. Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. In Acts 2, we saw 3,000 Jews from all over the Roman Empire, including North Africa, baptised. In Acts 8.12, we see Samaritans baptised who were mixed-blooded Jews. 
but now it's extended to an Ethiopian Gentile and not only that, a eunuch. Under the old covenant he was excluded from the assembly of the Lord on at least two counts and now he is baptised by one spirit into the body of Christ. I'm referring to 1 Corinthians 12, 13 there. And now he's actually united with Christ, Romans 6, 5. Can you see the massive shift that's going on here? We kind of read through it and um, yes, it's a, it's a nice narrative and it's a nice story, but we, I think we miss the, the, the huge shift that's going on well, it has to happen in people's minds as this gospel goes out to everyone. Verse 39, just reading it in the NIV again. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So that word uh, where it's translated suddenly took him away some don't quite have the the suddenly or the force of it in there um, ESV um, they came up out of the water the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away it sort of doesn't carry that suddenness the, the Greek word is hapazo snatch seize, gaze control over, snatch from the hand. It's a rapid movement. Some of you might be thinking, okay, where else do we see that Greek word hapazo? You know, I could hear the muttering down there. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 4.17, then we who are alive, who remain, will be snatched away at the same time together with them in the clouds for a meeting with the Lord in the air. And thus we will be together with the Lord always. So, yeah, so I'm switching between translations because I think the NIV did a much better job of catching that. It wasn't a just Philip sort of moved off somewhere, it's boom, uh, he's suddenly carried away to Azotus. Uh, I think, where was my... Got my maps out of order here. Or... Yeah, Ashdod would be the new name for it. So we've got Gaza, Jerusalem, Ashdod there, and later on he'll end up in Caesarea. So, yeah, there's a little scale there, down there, 30 kilometres. Suddenly he covered, yeah, some, somewhere about, yeah, 60 to 90 kilometres suddenly. And some people call that Philip's travel. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't a natural thing. It was a supernatural thing. We've got precedence for that sort of thing happening in Acts. Obviously Paul's talking about it in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. But in, um, whoops, I've cut off. I'm not sure if it's 1 Kings or 2 Kings now. But um, 2.11, we see that with Elijah um, and with Elisha witnessing. As they were walking along and walking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. So God has done amazing supernatural things in the past. And he will do amazing supernatural things in the future. So let's not play down those miracles, the signs and the wonders that Philip and Stephen and the apostles are doing. Let's not play that down to a naturalistic worldview. Uh, we live in a very, New Zealand's very humanistic and naturalistic where we say, no, there is no such thing as a real miracle, it's just biological, natural processes. No, God intervenes at times. He can do that at any time. But on the other hand, let's not try to manufacture or reproduce those things ourselves. So getting to the end of our passage there, the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. And that's the natural result of somebody hearing the good news and responding to it as rejoicing. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, joy. Second one, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Immediately 
here this eunuch is exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And no doubt he carries on on his way. And we never hear of him again in the Bible. But I did a bit of Googling. He does appear in Ethiopian history as Jean Daraba, favourite of the Queen of Ethiopia, Gassimat Kandaki, who had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem according to the law of Orit, the ancient law. So, yeah, we've got uh, secular history, I guess, if you like, tying in with the biblical history, as it always does. And uh, whenever somebody says, oh, this is just a fable, just give it some time and somebody will dig up something, and like the Erastus stone or something, and it'll prove, or the uh, Pilate um, sign. People were saying, oh, Pilate was, we've got nothing in history talking about Pilate until somebody dug up a, a, an inscription on, on Pilate. So give it time. But in this case, yeah, the Ethiopian records, going right back to, um, yeah, 4700 BC, yeah, actually, yeah, pick up on this eunuch. And it would seem, again, reading the Ethiopian history, at least the elite seem to have been Christianized at that point. So it'll be interesting getting to the new heaven and the new earth and talking to this Ethiopian and a few of the others and asking them, how did you hear the gospel? And we might track it back to uh, Jean Daraba. So verse 40, but Philip found himself at Azotus and he passed through, preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So just on that, yeah, where do you find yourself? Well, wherever you find yourself, do the same as what Philip was doing. Preach the gospel. And it talks about him there. He, he told him the gospel. That's, that's just one word, euangelio. Um, preaching, telling somebody the good news. And like Philip, to anyone, anywhere. It might be in the desert, it might be in the workplace here. Back in 8, to 8 verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So, yeah, we too need to be serious about equipping ourselves and to learning from gift, learn from gifted evangelists like Philip and also just putting it into practice. So we don't hear of Philip again for about 20 years until Paul and Luke stay with him in his house at Caesarea. By then he's got four daughters who are prophesying. Um, and yeah, if you want to look that up, it's in Acts 21, 8 to 9. So it seems that although he was covering huge amounts of mileage early in his ministry, he's uh, ended up in Caesarea for 20 years. So if we can make a little bit of a shift now, hopefully we've got a bit of a historical context there. This isn't just a nice story, this actually happened. This has impacted history and nations. And so what can we learn from Philip, the evangelist, about evangelism? And yeah, I was saying there, yeah, where it talks about preaching the gospel, that is coming from a Greek word, euangeleo, yeah, proclaiming the good news. And by the way, I'm not preaching here. The Christendom's kind of turned everything around the wrong way. Wherever in scripture we see that euangeleo, preaching, that's referring to preaching to the lost. What I'm doing here today is I'm teaching disciples. So, and there's a couple of other Greek words like didasko, where it's used for teaching. So I guess my point in that is whatever you feel about um, preaching and teaching, whose roles they are, everyone can proclaim the good news. Everyone can preach. Man, woman, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, whatever. So what can we learn about the event from Philip about uh, evangelism? Okay, going back to 
the start there. And uh, the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south. And he rose and he went. Simple. When God says rise and go, get up and go. And remember Philip started serving tables here. He was picked out as a faithful person. He's, he's, not, uh, he's not been set apart. Nobody's laid hands on him. He hasn't got some funny robes or anything to say he's evangelist. He's just filled with the Spirit and following the Spirit's leading. Now you might say, well, God hasn't told me to rise and go, so I haven't got up and gone yet. Well, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, most of you will know it well. Then Jesus came to them, that's to the apostles, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, and that's actually in the passive, therefore as you go, we could say, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And you might say, oh, well, that was just a commission for the apostles to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. But that comes down to us. They taught, you know, I don't know, 50 generations back, and now it's come down to us. We need to also do the same, uh, share the good news, make disciples and baptise, and we need to teach them to obey as well. And obey could be also translated to observe these things or to keep these things. It's not a, it's not a gutting it out obedience thing. It's just, hey, remember this, keep doing this. And it's a present tense continuing thing that we keep doing. So as you go, it's, um, it's not, you don't need, like Philip, you don't need an angel of the Lord or you don't need the spirit of the Lord specifically to say, go to Gaza. Might not be recommended just at the moment. I was thinking about this and uh, f for me and, and thinking, well, some advice to myself in my early 20s as I was setting out on my Christian walk now would be, John, don't worry about where you go so much. Focus about on how you go. And yeah, I praise God. He has sent me to Thailand, around the Pacific Islands, Tairawhiti, Morrinsville. So he's, yeah, he has led me, sent me those places. But it's funny when I look back, and I've often discussed this with people, you know, I think the most fruitful time of my ministry in the last 38 years was actually when I was working a full-time job, probably more like 50, 55 hours a week. Uh, but I was serving in a church uh, as an elder and I was a youth leader and had a lot of opportunities to share the gospel at work and other places. I look back on those times and I think, you know, that was probably the most fruitful time. So it's not so much that you've got to sort of have this great calling to go to Africa. It's wherever you go, go with that attitude of, hey, is there somebody there with questions that I can jump into their chariot with and explain some questions that they have to them? Second thing we might learn from Philip is join people where they are. So Philip's in the desert, the Ethiopian's in the desert. And if you follow that theme through Scripture, the desert, if you think of Jesus with his temptation, Moses and the Israelites, the desert is kind of, it's almost like Satan's domain. It's a dry, barren, empty, it's a place we don't want to go. You know, I want to, I want to be in the Garden of Eden, not in the wilderness outside of it. And yet Philip's going right through the desert because that's where the Ethiopian is. In this case, Philip's joining somebody who's travelling and displaced people are very open to the gospel. Both Rosemary and I were displaced people when we responded to the gospel. Uh, I'd been right around the world and almost back home, got to Australia before 
uh, I responded to the gospel. So yeah, join people wherever they are. And sometimes that means joining untouchables. That might mean that you, you go into places that maybe other Christians would say, hey, you shouldn't be there. But Jesus had the same problem. They accused of him of being a, a wine bibber a, and, a, and hanging out with prostitutes. So if you have a problem with alcohol or prostitutes, I suggest you don't go into those situations. But if your thinking is right and biblical, yeah, reach people wherever they are. And it may be that you just play to your own strengths. It might be your own sports club, um, your own hobby, whatever. Anything you can use to put you uh, in contact with people of all sorts. What else can we learn from Philip? From verse 30, ask questions. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? Now another approach could have been to run up to the Ethiopian and say, sit down, I've got a few things to tell you. But no, he starts with where the Ethiopian's at and uh, he asks questions. First he's finding out about the Ethiopian. I mean, yeah, he's obviously riding in a chariot. He's probably got others with him. Who is he? But what's on his mind? Do you understand what you're reading? Questions are wonderful. And he also answered questions. Whoops. Gave you the next point. Answer questions as well. So start where they're at. Verse 34. The eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? It's, um, it's always good to work with the spirit where the spirit is working. And in this case, this Ethiopian's he's got a question. It's no point answering every other theological truth that the Ethiopian needs to know first. Deal with the, the what, uh, what some would call the point of felt need. His felt need is there, hey, there's a riddle here, there's a mystery. Can you explain this mystery to, to me? So yeah, questions, dig all that out. Conversation, interaction, getting to know people. And then we find out what their what their touch point is, their, their felt need is. Verse 35, we read, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Again, that could have been translated, he preached to him the gospel, but they've translated it, told him the good news. It's, it's all the same word, euangelio. So we do actually have to open our mouth, as that uh, Francis of Assisi quote about, um, you know, oh, I can't remember it now, I should have written it down, but yeah. Um, can anyone quote it for me? If need be, use words. Yeah, if need be, use words. Yeah, it's kind of like, well, you don't actually have to use words. I say, open your mouth. God's given it to you not just to eat with, but to proclaim good news. So, yeah, sometimes you're in that situation. I've been in that situation where I'm sitting there, you know, and it's a really secular situation, and the conversation's going along, and then you're thinking, right, now it's time to open my mouth. And once I do, it's going to be all on. <laughs> and so, yeah, open your mouth. And elsewhere in Scripture, I, can't remember, I didn't look this up, but, you know, open your mouth, he said, and I will fill it. Yeah, when we open our mouth, God starts leading us by his Holy Spirit and we get into some really good conversations. Okay, once they have trusted Jesus to pay the price for their sins, baptise them. So... We've got uh, all sorts of funny concepts here. 1,700 years of Christendom since Constantine legalised and institutionalised Christianity has done awful things to baptism. Some use Matthew 28, 19, which we read before, to say we baptise disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son. 
So they would say, because of that, that we only disciple, we only baptize disciples, so we need to see fruit before we baptize. That's taking scripture out of context. That is not how the early church inter interpreted Matthew 28, 19. Baptism in scripture immediately follows the decision to believe in Christ. We see that uh, back in Acts 2, 3,000 people were baptised in one day. Now maybe somebody slipped through. Maybe somebody wasn't a genuine believer there. Not a problem. God can sort that out. He's bigger than that. But people professed faith in Christ, trusting in him to pay for their sins. 3,000 people were baptised in one day. The same day. There wasn't baptismal classes. There wasn't waiting to see if there was any fruit there. Wasn't waiting till they cleaned their lives up, got off their drugs and alcohol. Um, yeah, make that point, put that uh, stake in the sand to say this is the day that you identify with Christ's burial, uh, sorry, death, burial and resurrection. This is who you are now. Acts 2 verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So as I say, the Samaritans were baptised immediately and just in further back in Acts 8 and the eunuch here. So Philip did not go back with him to Ethiopia and make sure that he was living the Christian life. He just baptised him and just as well he did. There's no probation period, no provisional membership to the church. You are all in. In or out, if you could say. It's not earned by good works. And in regarding baptism or anything else, in fact, you are not the judge. God is the only judge. If they profess Christ, faith in Christ alone, baptise them. Notice in verse 30, uh, 36, the eunuch says, what prevents me from being baptised? So here it's actually at the request of the baptisee. So that's a good thing too, and that's kind of going to rule out infant baptism and so on. Note a few things that did not occur here. Philip did not take the Samaritans or the eunuch back to the apostles, or to a paid professional clergyman. And he did not take them to an organisation or to a special building. We are baptising them into the church, not into our church. So now I'll switch to my opinion. In my opinion, baptising in public is good in New Zealand. In some places, baptising in public would get you all killed very quickly. Uh, so I'll, this is my opinion, uh, and that's, this would be situational. So... So personally, I like the beach or the rivers uh, and with as many friends and family there to witness the event as possible. So yeah, there's a few things that we can yeah, look at it in historical context and pair it back and think, okay, what are the basics here? Sorry. So in conclusion, what can we learn from the example of Philip the Evangelist? When God says rise and go, get up and go. And by the way, we have been told, get up and go. Join people where they are, ask lots of questions and ask questions as they arise. Share the good news about Jesus, not about everything else in religion. And get to the point, get to Jesus, the death, burial and resurrection. And as you carry on through Acts, which I think is going to, there's going to be a bit of a pause, Lincoln's been talking to me about it, but as you carry on through Acts, look how the, the apostles or whoever is preaching the gospel go straight for the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, particularly with Gentiles. Um, there's some talk, uh, teaching, some evangelists say you need to go to the law first. Uh, I don't see a pre precedent for that in scripture with Gentiles. Yes, if they're a Jew, go for the law. 
but um, go for the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. Did it happen? What's the historical basis for it? Why did he have to die? Why, what is he remedying? Basically the fall or our sin. Uh, and yeah, they, when they're proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles, to non-Jews, that seems to be their focus. So share the good news about Jesus. You don't necessarily have to go right through Moses and the Ten Commandments and all that sort of thing. If it's going to be helpful, by all means, rip into it. And then if a person decides to believe in Christ, baptise them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for filling Philip with your spirit and with wisdom. And thank you for the way you used him. And thank you that the... The writer Luke wrote this down for us to learn from, from a, a good example. Thank you too for the eunuch and possibly the impact that we see from his life in Ethiopian history. And thank you that we have that same Holy Spirit living in us and the gospel still continues to go out to all sorts of people in all sorts of different places most unlikely people and even some just very normal, ordinary people. So I pray that we would have the great privilege of being able to share the gospel with someone this week, even today possibly, and that you would use that to bring new life and that we'd be able to rejoice with them for eternity. So we praise you, Lord. We love you. We worship you. We thank you for involving us in your work. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.